Minnesota Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw, a special rock and roll edition. I am Bradshaw. That is your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And as a young kid who grew up loving the British invasion, this is a massive treat for me. The group Cream was an innovative group. It was the first super group with uh, Jack Bruce, Ginger Baker, and Eric Clapton. 15 million albums sold. Rock and Roll Hall of Famers transformed the industry and now that his son jack malcolm bruce is bringing out a tribute album to this iconic band malcolm welcome to the show hey great to be here thanks for thanks for inviting me hey malcolm man what a pleasure it is you know I, as you can see i'm a, i'm an old fart so man i go way <laughs> back with rock and roll you know like john said the invasion was one of the one of the craziest things in my my lifetime era that i that i can recall it you know, wasn't wasn't always met with a bunch of old crazy rednecks like me, or you know, with open arms in the beginning. But then you started listening to the music, and the background a lot of those, a lot of that music, you know, came from the folk style type music. You know, the the super groups and everything. Then along came Cream, this super rock and roll group that was just blew everybody's mind. There, tell us a little bit about the history of Cream, and you know, of course. I don't know how old you were at the time. You couldn't have been very old, but uh, you know, some of the some of the super members that, that are rock icons and Hall of Famers now. But tell us how how Cream got started. Well, yeah, um, well, I wasn't actually quite born uh, yet when they were around. I was born just after they kind of broke up. Um, but it's an interesting story. So they they all kind of were known on the UK scene, you know. Uh, Jack, Eric, and Ginger, they'd all played in loads of different bands. My dad had played in right back in 1961, 62. He was in the Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated and then uh, the Graham Bond organization. And he'd, he'd done like little stints with Man for Man and John Mayle wow. and all these kind of incredibly important people in the early history of British, as you say, the what ended up being the British invasion or the second British invasion after the Beatles, I guess, right? Okay. Um, and Ginger, the same, he played, he went back to the kind of jazz, early jazz times of in the UK, and Eric had played with John Mayle and all kinds of people. And so the story goes is that Eric was playing a gig with John Mayle in Oxford, which is like an hour and a bit outside of London, west of London. And Ginger w went with his wife, Liz, drove out there to see the show. And after the show had a drink, Ginger had a drink with Eric and he said, hey, man, I want to put a band together with you. You know, they'd crossed paths before, obviously, so they knew each other. And Eric and Eric said, OK, let's do it. But it has to be Jack Bruce on bass. And um, the thing is that my dad and, and Ginger had been in these bands, Alexis Corner's band and um, Graham Bond's band, and they'd kind of fallen out. They had this sibling thing, which I don't think any of us understand or will ever fully understand um and ginger had fired my dad from graham's band at knife point he sort of <laughs> pulled him he'd like gone boy mate you had a band <laughs> and i think apparently my dad like kept turning up to the rehearsal you know rehearsals the next day and he's like i'm not you can't fire me you know <laughs> anyway so they hadn't been speaking for maybe i don't know a year or something or six months and so because Eric, you know, Ginger loved and respected Eric so much, he kind of buried the hatchet. Okay, that's, that's I didn't, it's quite appropriate to say that. Um, and, he had, and actually, my mum, I was speaking to my mum, Janet, about this recently, and apparently my mum organised for them to get together, Ginger and my dad, Jack, at my grandparents' house as a kind of neutral place for them to sort of kiss and make up and for Ginger to... <laughs> to formally ask my dad if he put this thing together. And so that was the beginning of Cream. It's wow. kind of a, a strange way of putting a plan together. All right, well, I won't pull a knife on you then. All right, then. <laughs> Malcolm, I've heard that, I was reading this story last night about the knife. Oh, yeah, yeah. A couple of things, a couple of questions. <laughs> One, what's he doing with a knife? Is, was it a blade? Was it something in his jacket? And, and what was you it? You know, well, I don't know, because like in contemporary... Britain. I mean, obviously, we don't have guns on the same level. You guys have the gun thing, right? right. Um, which, yeah. well, and and you know, I I understand it's part of your constitution. So you, you know, most people are really they they know how to deal with firearms, and it's a right to have them. But here, we don't have that. We don't really have that in our culture. We have 
knife crime, you know. So we have like <laughs> teenagers knifing each other on the street because they're in the wrong, we call it postcode, but like the wrong, they kind of say, what zip code are you from? And if you're in from the wrong, you kind of stepped over the wrong street, wow. like, like <laughs> knife, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And recently, a few over the last few years, we've had these, I got robbed by two guys, two mopeds or, you know, little scooter <laughs> bikes, two guys on each bike. And they kind of, they practice and they swoop in and they steal your cell phone out of your hand, you know, and then they sell, sell it on the black market. So, and they, they carry these huge machetes. They like get a machete out and threaten people. You know? <laughs> but I think ginger, I don't know what kind of knife it was. Like, a, I don't know, like a <laughs> pen knife or a, a little hunting knife or something, you know, nothing too extreme. I don't <laughs> nothing think. too extreme. Uh, <laughs> yeah. enough, but a knife just nonetheless. Enough to break, <laughs> just enough yeah. to break up a band. Yeah, yeah well, just enough to like for my. It didn't seem to dissuade my dad from turning up to the rehearsal the next day. But that was That's my dad. The best was, part uh, of the story. Confident. I, I, I love, when I was reading it, I just loved it. It kind of reminded me. I got a couple of books back here. That our good friend uh, from uh, UK, William Regal, uh, uh, one of the uh, well famous old wrestler wrestlers from yeah. from uh, oh okay from the UK gave me about the soccer hooligans and 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 the yeah. fights and and. I gave as you as you and you to reinforce what I've read that you know the knives were the way of life back there because all these hooligan uh, soccer soccer thugs that uh, carried the knives around to to harass yeah. the, other, the other players and and the fans and everything. So that's kind yeah. of what I came from. And I think um, my dad. I remember my dad telling me because he was from Glasgow, you know, which is a whole other thing. Uh, you know, uh, the gangs in Glasgow were notorious back in the day. And I think he was growing up in the 50s. Um, and they used to have a cork with a with a razor blade in it. You know, that's yeah. like the poor man's knife, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so it's like you can't afford a knife. You yeah. get a little cork from your wine bottle and a razor yeah. blade and you stick it in. You go, what? <laughs> but um, it's kind of weird because I, it's the opposite. I'm like peace. I, I'm all about peace and love. You know, I'm not into well, violence. I'm not into war and anything. Like Change all that stuff, Malcolm. <laughs> you know? yeah. I, I, Malcolm, what what happened in the 1960s or 1950s, rather? Because that's when it had to be born. Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, you have the Rolling Stones, you have the Who, you have the Beatles, you have Cream, the Yard, uh, the Yardbirds. I mean, you have you have all these incredible bands. Now, you didn't have that in the 20s. You didn't have in the 30s. All of a sudden, the 60s, all of this happens. It didn't happen over here. We had Elvis at the time, but not not the super bands. What happened in, in I think it's a I think it's a cultural thing and I think I always use the term baby boomer generation which I guess you know it was something completely unique because up until well as you know up until the 50s there wasn't really a youth culture you know uh, it was a different thing and then I guess the birth of uh, multimedia you know global media television radio uh, record you know pop records but I think the the, I think the youth culture came to the fore. And um, before that, you didn't really have that. It was a much more kind of um, rigid structure, uh, kind of social structure. And that was breaking down. Then there's also the class structure breaking down. So, you know, most people, working class people would, you know, be kind of, all right, I'll, you know, I'll go, I'll do what I'm told, you know, to the middle classes and the upper classes. And, uh, you know, go and work in the factory. You know, it's the blue collar thing, right? And we still have that. But right. oh. it sort of broke down to some degree at that time. So you had working class people suddenly hobnobbing with royalty or with rich people or becoming rich themselves because through pop music or sport or or whatever, maybe a bit of wrestling, you might make a few million. I don't know. But, oh. but I think there's all these elements. I think everything we had... the. the this war, this Second World War, you guys came in towards the end and helped finish it. But huh. but I think that that kind of changed everything because, you know, economically, socially, culturally, everything changed. And, you know, I don't know. I think all of those things must have had an impact on, on uh, the birth of this thing. Now, also, we, the British, kind of stole your music. You know, a lot of it, you know, black american music but also as you say like that's it's more complex than that because you've got the whole kind of southern thing you know uh folk traditions and all kinds of different things all different influences and so the british stole that or took it creatively and kind of reinvented it and i think i think cream are a great example of that you know right. that they they took they loved you know 
they loved Willie Dixon and they loved Albert Kim and uh, you know all these incredible artists that were there but were kind of bubbling under the surface somewhat because of their race essentially and now that's all changed obviously you know and that's for the better in my opinion um, but at that point it was almost like and you know obviously there's a little bit of notoriety with people like Elvis because he became this huge star but but he was kind of really off the back of the black communities and black music although he right. loved yeah. he yeah. he was friends with them but culturally you know that there was a kind of segregation and all of that kind of stuff that, that thankfully is not so prevalent um in a, in our societies but you know i think it was just this big melting pot of ideas and suddenly for a moment people were cut loose and there was yeah. this kind of idealism that maybe we could have a better world i'm not sure that it kind of panned out because i think you know the corporations came in right they go oh right, we can yeah. make some money out of this yeah, maybe even but... the cia comes and says how can we control the youth yeah, population yeah, exactly. maybe, we'll, maybe we'll let them take acid you know or maybe maybe a so social <laughs> then, experiment then, 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 you what, what what you're saying there was very important here the black music you know the, the, like, like i was going to the cultural music you know, i was going to try to compare over there you know and and john from texas that dirty state of texas and i'm from the great state of oklahoma we kind of hate each other that cultural difference and you mentioned glass and all and you know, of course, Liverpool here in the States is the 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 place that, you know, we over here know music, you know, with the Beatles and all that stuff, the Stones. There. Was, was there that, that type of cultural war where there, I mean, battles are going on and still at each other? And how, how did that play out in, in Cream well, development? Well, I'm not sure if it affected Cream, but I mean, certainly in a, in a wider context, it was a, and still is, a North-South divide. I suppose a little bit like in the States, I've spent a lot of time in Nashville um, and, and some time in Louisiana and I've toured all over the country right. uh, a number of times. But um, but I think there is a kind of pride in the South that's a beautiful thing um, in, in America. And in, in, in it's kind of the reverse in the UK. It's like there's a pride in the North. There's a kind of yeah, 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 yeah. And North. you guys are completely opposite. Op opposite. Now, the yeah, yeah. South here is you know considered you know the South, and and the North yes. is, is considered what the aristocratic world. It's the opposite in the UK. It seems right? to be. Yeah. I mean, it's you know obviously all of that's breaking down. But I think I mean I just did a gig the other day up in near Leeds, which is kind of heading pretty far north, and they're just wonderful people. They're they're welcoming in the same way that people in the south are welcome if you're respectful you know if if you show if you're sincere and authentic then people are going to accept you for who you are whereas in the south of the uk it's a little bit more cutthroat and competitive and and also multicultural which i like i i love mul the multicultural aspect of it um but i suppose it's a little bit swapped around but it's a gem we're generalizing because it's just always in flux right you know i mean that's one of the main issues in both our countries at the moment you know immigration and right. how do you deal with those things because immigrant you know we're all immigrants right I mean, essentially <laughs> exactly. you know where where does that begin and end well I mean, well in, in 66 in this country in, fair, in fairness <laughs> Malcolm, uh mr gerald briscoe is not an immigrant so he, he's, okay uh, you're he's, uh, he's, he's a full-blooded indigenous. Uh, full -blooded native <laughs> american so uh Oh, he, that's he beautiful. Tell you, he will uh, tell you the rest of us are, are the ones that uh, he he said they should yeah. have built the wall back in 1600. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's that, true. That's I mean, what that's what I wanted the wall. You know, that <laughs> that's me. right. We we well, could get you guys to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, nobody wants to pay for the wall. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, Malcolm, well, how would you define the music of Cream? Because you talk about the blues uh, emphasis yeah. in this, and you listen to it, it sounds like a lot of Southern blues, but it's it's a new type of music that you guys were developing, a psychedelic rock, rock. It was the birth of rock and roll. How would you define the differences, or do you care to define the differences? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it was a still is and was a very unique band in the sense that you've got these three very strong personalities who all had different influences. My dad was a classically trained musician, um, but also grew up uh, listening to and singing Scottish folk music. You know, my grandmother was uh, a singer, not, you know, an amateur singer, but, she, but, you know, up in Scotland, like in Ireland, there's there's a strong folk tradition. 
and in England too, but certainly the certainly in Scotland, the, the you know Robert Burns lyrics turned into songs and all kinds of things like that. And my dad grew up listening to all of that, but he then was a boy soprano in choirs singing within the Western classical tradition. Then he discovered jazz and and through jazz, the roots of jazz, one of the roots of jazz, which is blues. And with Eric, he was more like a blues purist. He'd, he'd studied the, the American blues artists in depth and really understood that tradition. And Ginger was certainly a jazz drummer very early on and then discovered the blues as well, but also African music. Actually, if you listen to his, uh, the first version of Toad, which is on Fresh Green, especially the mono version because it sounds better than the stereo version but but if you listen to how ginger plays on that you're it's like a, it's like african music it's it's unbelievable and this is 1966 that that really is so so i think there's all these disparate influences that combine to make and that's what makes cream so interesting they're not just i say just i mean if you talk if we talked about the beatles they were genius songwriters but they were songwriters and they're great singers and songwriters, but they weren't really instrumentalists. They weren't kind of master musicians in that way. And they they didn't want to be. They What they loved was songwriting and they became arguably the greatest songwriters that will ever exist because of the impact that they had. But with Cream, they were players. They were working musicians that had spent, you know, kind of the best part of a decade touring the clubs and playing you know early r&b music and and being a part of developing that tradition but it all could also improvise and play and my dad understood that whole classical tradition um and and i hear that in the writing and the playing um of cream i hear uh classical developmental techniques and but i hear the jazz things and i hear the african things and i hear you know a song like as you said for instance which um, I'm not sure Eric's on that, but but you know it's acoustic guitar um, and uh, Ginger's hi hat and cello and the way the the way the music develops, it's kind of unfolding and developing in a more kind of classical way that you take a motif and you develop it and stretch things and it doesn't repeat the same. You know, a lot of songs would be verse, pre-chorus, chorus, middle eight, etc., and those those blocks. Are, tend to be the same. Whereas with Cream, you hear things developing. And then when they improvise, that's a whole other thing too, because it's like this living organism that can go anywhere. And of course, lots of traditions have that. But I think the way, the uniqueness of those three guys and how they brought those, those elements together just created something, a body of work that I think it stands the test of time and it's, it's very unique. Um, I mean, I guess yeah. we could talk about the Grateful Dead in their own way. They, you know, but that's a whole other, you know, 27 hour show uh, <laughs> or whatever. You know, I, I love that stuff, but it's very different from Cream. Again, they had a personality and they, they were just three of them. So they weren't crowding each other in the sonic spectrum. They, they could all have this equal uh, expression of their ideas and not kind of you know and i've experienced that myself like if you're in a band with four guys and there's two guitar players it's a whole different experience if there's just one guitar player then you're the guitarist and you can do you can play harmony melody you can do anything and you're not getting in the way no one's getting in the way of you so i think that's that trio thing also contributed to it as well and and your mother wrote uh, some songs for cream as well right one of the first songs that was introduced how did that dynamic work was was she obviously she was a musician a very accomplished one but how did that dynamic work with the group yes i mean she she learned you know like a, a, certainly in this country we had um and we still have to some degree like that tradition when you're a kid you learn a musical instrument probably the piano or the violin uh, or the recorder or whatever you know <laughs> at school and you know but my mom had piano lessons and she was musical is musical um although she wouldn't claim to be anything she was just around and um she actually wrote lyrics for the graham bond organization they they um released a, a seminal album i guess you could call it called the sound of 65 in 1965 that was a really groundbreaking album for the time um, and she wrote a couple of songs <clears throat> on that. And then a year later, 
as you mentioned, uh, Sleepy Time Time was, if not the first, one of the first songs that Green wrote. And she just wrote some lyrics, gave it, told my dad, oh, I've got some words, and he set it to music. And so it's all very innocent. It wasn't right. kind of structured. I think those things just happened. There was a spontaneity um, it, it, at that time, you know, um, right. for, for them. Um, but, so yeah, she she's she has written songs. She wrote, and then she, interestingly with with Ginger, he brought in uh, the lyricist Pete Brown to work with Cream uh, with the idea, um, based on the idea that it was Ginger and Pete would write songs together. But they tried to write together and it didn't work. And so Pete started working like writing with my dad, and Ginger ended up writing Sweet Wine with with my mum. So she wrote one song with my dad, one song with my mum on that first album yeah. one thing that i didn't hear is didn't see explained when i was reading about you and, and watching videos the last couple of days was the the song wrapping paper when they put it out it was different than what they apparently sounded live uh wh why did they put that out and, and you know sometimes yeah very creative people they just try something different was this them trying something different was that what it was with that song and it just seems strange that in 66 that's that's the song that they lead with was was something that was a bit of a divergence to what they were doing in bars and life oh absolutely i mean the other one to mention is anyone for tennis you know <laughs> which is another song that's kind of like doesn't really feel like um whoever made that decision but, you know, I guess there was that kind of psychedelia thing. There was, you know, um, I don't know, Moody Blues, Wider Shade of Pale. There was all those kinds of things that were a bit, maybe a bit more sort of orthodox or, or looking back to a kind of um, vaudeville almost. We would call it vaudeville. I don't know what you guys, maybe you'd call it vaudeville. I don't know. Um, so I hear those elements in it. But, I, you know, I can't imagine. There is actually a really famous uh, sort of music video of uh cream playing anyone for tennis where they're playing but they're supposed to be miming but they just sort of start laughing and and, <laughs> and purposefully play out of time or whatever you know um sort of out of sync and all of that kind of stuff i don't think that they that's really what they wanted to do you know but maybe the record label or robert stigwood their manager thought it was a good idea at the time well um, sometimes in the 60s you, know, you did things that didn't make a lot of sense yeah, exactly. I'm sure. I, I'm sure. I, I got jealous of one of that. Yes, we did. <laughs> well, the, the it, drugs, it was the drugs, about the '60s. Drugs were much here. longer then. I'm sure. You know. Yeah, I have, a, I have a slight <laughs> memory lapse of '60s. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what they say. You know, if if you uh, remember it, you weren't there or something. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> was this <laughs> over? Was this overwhelming to you, Malcolm, to start putting this all together? I mean, you're you're not just doing a, a tribute album to a band. You're doing a tribute album to one of the greatest your bands family. of all time, and your dad, one of the greatest your family <laughs> bass players of all time. What, was this overwhelming to me? And, and it was also pretty cool because you got to work with Ginger Baker before he passed away. And I understand because of the pandemic, you've been working on this for for a really long time. Was it a bit overwhelming to you to put this together? Um, I don't think so. We had a great team of people. We all, a lot of us knew each other. Rob Cass, the producer's wonderful. And Bernie Marsden, who also passed away last year, he was heavily involved. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a weird one, isn't it? Like you're, as the child of somebody famous from the outside, it comes with all this stuff, but it's just, my dad is my dad. I love him. I, I respect him. And so it was a nice thing to do. Um, and it was really lovely to sort of see the level of uh musician that agreed to come and do it you know you got paul rogers and joe bonamassa and all wow. just incredible you know maggie bell um bobby rush wow i mean that was an amazing day you know to have bobby come in and yeah. work with us and lead the sessions you know just great talent and so i think it i think we were lucky we had a, a kind of good feeling in the studio and a team effort you know there weren't pe people put their egos to one side there was not no egos and i think that that makes it much more a much smoother process obviously i could, if i think about it too much there's a lot of pressure on getting it right but yeah. but the whole thing with cream was that they weren't getting it right they were doing it 
it was fresh every time they played, you know, and I think that that's, again, that's a unique aspect to Cream. Um, a lot of bands play it note perfect every time the same. And that that's another art <clears throat> skill that skill set that's really amazing. And, you know, I play classical piano, so I spend all day long working on something so that I do perform it, you know, every dynamic is correct and the tempos are correct and all of that. But with with the blues, I think the blues, true, the real blues is an open-ended concept. You know, it's not, you don't, you don't perform it the same every time. You perform it based on the spirit, the soul of yourself, you know, being in touch with who you are and, um, and how you're feeling, you know, and hopefully somehow that's connected, that you're expressing a deeper aspect of the self. Um, and so, yeah, I think I work, I attempt in, in all humility to, uh, to, you know, to find that connection that deeper connection within myself when I make music. But, you know, even in practical terms, I think we just had a great bunch of people on this record and, so, and you know, great technical team. Rob Cass is a wonderful producer, great mix engineer. So, you know, we, we got a great result and I think that made us feel comfortable. Um, you know, if if, um, if we'd had any major problems along the way, then, then you start worrying, oh, is this gonna work out? But everybody turned up and put their egos to one side and performed wonderfully so you talk about the how, how, ahead, how, how, how was the reaction of these guys when you went and said we want to recreate history like this uh, I mean, were they, are you crazy or any of those <laughs> stuff like <laughs> well no they said oh, are you crazy before anything uh, yeah well, you, you, know, know, you, know, you must that, be they, crazy you're just crazy <laughs> no um I, I think one one thing that's important to uh mention is it's an, an acoustic record so we didn't go in and say, I'm going to copy Eric's guitar solo with the wah wah and try and be better than Eric or something, because he could never do that. I mean, what they achieved on those records and life, but, you know, because it's a record just focusing on that, there's no point in competing, you know, with my dad's voice or bass playing or, or Ginger or any of it. Um, so I think that took a little bit of pressure off. We're, we're taking the songs and we're interpreting them in an acoustic context. Um, so you're just stripping it down, you know, melody, harmony, feel, um, it's not about how fast you can play or how flashy or how great you are and all of that kind of stuff. So I think it, it seems like, yeah. so what I read was that, or at least my understanding was that Ginger was working on this and then passed away because of the, the delay of COVID and all of that different stuff that happened. So this is really a tribute album to Ginger. That's got to be really cool to work with this band member. And this is their last uh, collaboration that you're putting out. Yeah, I mean, it was amazing. We, you know, we did finish the record. Um, we also shot a, a documentary that's available to stream on Sunstream, I believe, um, called The Cream Acoustic Sessions. So it was a big job. Um, and I think as we were kind of approaching completion, we were hitting the end of 2019. And then when the pandemic happened i guess for whatever reason that the label decided to hold back a little before the release um and i think it's good timing i think they made the right choice um but yes ginger passed away at the end of 2019 and then we lost you know Wee ellis from james brown's band who's on the record as well he passed away uh bernie marsden who i mentioned mo foster british bass player passed away um so yes we lost quite a few people on the record and yeah, I mean, it's a real, it was, you know, Ginger played so beautifully, um, contributed so much to it. And it did end up, I believe, being his last recording session. I'm actually working with with uh, Ginger's son, Kofi Baker, as, as well. We're actually going out as the Sons of Cream. Uh, so we're going to be touring. And he's, a again, another wonderful, he's a wonderful drummer that's kind of taken what uh, his dad did and sort of made it his own. Uh, sort of keeping the, the Baker legacy going. So, um, right. so yeah, it, it's a little bit of a family tradition, although I'm writing my own music and doing my own things which aren't like Cream at all. I think it's quite nice to to to, to do this, you know, because to kind of um, honour that legacy because it's had such an impact and um, it's such wonderful music to play. But yes, I think the less we think generally in life, the better, you know, don't get into like my, the head, don't get into your head about it. Oh my, I'll never be as, I mean, I know I'll never be as good as my dad at doing cream because that was him, you know, that's, that's that was it. who yeah. he is, you know, so yeah. it's just, 
it's just nice to honor it really my, my wife is my wife is only 54 so she wasn't born when when cream was uh, making music at, at the time you know in the 60s but when i told her that i was doing this show today she she said oh my goodness with clapton she knew all the guys which kind of surprised me not because of the impact of cream today but because my, i didn't know my wife was a rock and roll fan so but oh my it, it tells you something <laughs> about cream that 60 years ago basically was when they were in their heyday when they were performing there in england and to this day they, they didn't have that long a run you know they only had a few year run and they created this thing they transformed the business in that amount of time did your dad ever talk about the fact that they wish they'd kind of been like maybe the rolling stones or something i wish they'd stayed together and and done done 10 or 20 years more of music i mean i think they all had and obviously eric is still out there doing it um and wonderfully too um but i think you know just historically they all all had these incredible careers with incredibly diverse and did so many different things so i think i mean selfishly i think i'm glad in a way that they lasted just under three years and then they all went off and did so many other incredible projects you know with my dad west bruce and lang and you know something like 15 solo records and um you know lifetime with tony williams and john mclaughlin and all of that you know just all these incredible collaborations and ginger opened the first studio in africa or multi-track you know where paul mccartney and wings recorded and um and eric obviously just so many amazing things but i think you know my dad got got ill and had a liver transplant and i think after that it was only one year after that the cream reformed uh 2005 and did these shows at uh, the Albert Hall in the UK and then at the Garden in New York um, and I think at that point my dad sort of you know maybe as we get to a point where we're sort of facing our mortality I don't know whether it's something like he'd kind of gone through this incredible journey of having a liver transplant and almost dying and going into comas wow. and coming out of comas and you know we were all kind of standing around and the doctors go he's not going to pull through you know and then he did and um and then they were all standing on stage together for the first wow. time in many many years and i think i think my dad would have liked at that point for it to be longer than just well whatever it was four or five shows in the uk and then three shows in the us but you know him and Ginger, the knife came, the metaphorical knife came out again. I think <laughs> <laughs> at that point. So unfortunately, like, uh, did did, um, they, did they just not get along? I mean, were they just like two different personalities? I think they loved each other so much, but but I think that they, you know, all three of those guys had. Look, you know, it's not a judgment to say they had their drug issues and their personal problems. We all we all have what we have. None of us are. You know, we all have to stay humble and realize that this life, this journey in life is what it is, right? We're, we're just children learning along the way. And, you know, in their case, they had all their issues. So I think, you know, Ginger was a registered heroin addict. You know, in the early 60s, you could be a registered heroin addict in the UK. <laughs> go, go to your general practitioner and say, I, all right, could I have my have my script, please. And then you go to the chemist and get your smack, you know. Um, and uh, so like Ginger had done all of that before Cream even was formed, you know. Um, my dad had his problems later on and Eric had his problems later on. They all came through it. Um, but I, I think, who knows? I mean, I think the history that my dad and Ginger shared was so deep um, yeah. that there, there were sort of primal things going on maybe compared competition on, on some levels but i think when it comes down to it they they loved each other from musically you know uh, yeah you know and i i've said this before in interviews um at my dad's funeral i was standing with ginger and he was bawling his eyes out he was crying he was deeply you know yeah. moved by my dad passing so you know that's not somebody that hates somebody you know that's somebody sure that maybe, sure but you know sometimes builds up Builds up some bravado and some bolshiness, right. like, you know, I'm going to act a certain way. But, you know, Ginger, again, he's misunderstood. He was a very sensitive, intelligent guy that just put a wall up, as, or maybe for self-protection. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know Ginger well enough to really have an opinion. But I love him for his creativity, you know. And for the few times I got to play with him, it was just wonderful. So.
You you mentioned working with Ginger's son uh, on on an upcoming project. Did uh, did, did when when you were growing up, uh, Malcolm? Were you uh, did you kind of morph into music naturally, or was you kind of given instruments and said, learn how to play this? You're 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 the next, or how how, how did that how did that start out with your beginnings? Yeah, I can't even remember like I, when I didn't have music. I think it was. I guess it was just a natural thing. You know, I'm at home, there's pianos lying around, guitars lying around, basses lying around. Um, and and I just, I think by the age of five, I was having piano lessons. Um, and, um, you know, a few years later, I picked up the bass guitar, maybe when I was about eight. Uh, and then when I was nine, I think my dad gave me my first kind of at Christmas, I got this electric guitar. Uh -huh. and, uh, so yeah, it was just very early on. I was writing music. I was learned to notate music very early on. And this was something you were wanting to do. Uh, uh... I, I, well, I really wanted to be a you know a neuroscientist, but yeah. no, I'm, I, I, you know, I think, um, or a, a, I, you know, as we say with Monty Python, uh, there's a sketch where he goes, uh, he's an accountant. He's a yeah. chartered accountant. He goes. What I really want to be is a lion tamer, you know. <laughs> but um, no, I think it was just, yeah, I think both me and Kofi, we just, yeah. that was, we just naturally fell into it. Um, we didn't really, it wasn't even a conscious thing, you know, but I do remember by the age. Did, did you ever feel the pressure, you know, hey, my dad's this guy here, <laughs> you know, I got to be good. Yeah, I mean, my dad was, and I guess. Uh oh, um, oh, you're back. You're back. Yeah. Throw this for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they, some people are like that. You know, they put themselves first. But you know, who am I to judge? I suppose I, I could do with putting myself a bit more in my life. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but yes, I think, um, I think it's a, it's a double-edged sword when you're the son of somebody right. so successful or accomplished. You know, because you tend to live in their shadow. Or that can happen. The industry can say, "Hey, do a do sunshine of your love," and then do your original stuff, not the other way around. So, and I guess you know other people like Sean Lennon, who's on the next level. Up, he's on the top right. tier of this whole kind of being the kid of somebody famous. Uh, I'm sure if you talk to him, he would probably express certain feelings about it all as well. It's like I'm not just, but then, but then you embrace it too because you're so proud of yeah. what your parent has accomplished yeah. you know it's yeah. just you can't really put it into words but i think it is a double-edged sword because you are also your it own is. person yeah. your own person and your your own spirit and, and you want to be recognized as that aspect you know i'm a writer i'm writing songs i'm writing opera i'm doing i'm exploring my creativity and i suppose one facet of that is honoring my my family and i think that's a beautiful thing to honor your family always um if you can uh, as long as they don't beat you up too much, or you know, but but I think um, you know I had a good relationship. It was a challenging relationship with my dad, um, but we loved each other and we shared we shared a deep bond in music. We made music together from very early on, and then he brought me into some of his uh, recording projects. And I do you, you recall your first time you were on stage uh, playing with your dad? Um, probably when I was about 17 in, um, I did a show with him in Budapest in Hungary. Wow. Um, I did, I, we played the San Remo Blues Festival in Northern Italy, probably around the same time, something wow. like that. Yeah. That's it wasn't cool. like super, it wasn't super early. If you, if you talk to Kofi, I think Kofi appeared at the age of three on the old gray whistle test, you know, the famous show <laughs> from the UK with his dad, uh, with a tambourine or something, I don't know. So uh, he he started a little earlier, but I was doing, I was playing music uh, in public before that. But I think the first time with my dad was around the age of seventeen. So. Wow. Just south of me is a, a friend of men, Jerry's a Mark Henry. Mark Henry was l the world's strongest man a couple different times, and, and they say oh, wow. he might be the strongest person that ever lived. But he's certainly in the top three or four that ever lived. And his son is now in high school, a terrific world class athlete. He's a wow. strong like his daddy. But I've always thought that's the toughest thing in the world because I see his. He's such a proud father, Mark is. And there's his son squatting this, you know, massive amount of weight. And his dad is the literally the world's strongest man. <laughs> you know, that's just yeah. So 
you, so you have to kind of, I think with that's, you know, my dad had this incredibly, he worked very hard early on, but I think he had a natural, we all have our strengths and weaknesses. Aren't we? we have our natural abilities and then we have other stuff that we have to work on really hard to find. And I think with my dad, he had certain things that just came more or less naturally to him. And as you say, you know, if you're the world's strongest man and your your kid is like almost the world's strongest man, yeah. then, <laughs> then, then you have to um, kind of have a little bit of compassion and encouragement, even though you might kind of think, well, actually, he'll never be quite as strong as me. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. It's crazy. It's like comparisons. Competition is a natural aspect to being human. And I think it's healthy. You know, it's healthy to, it makes people try harder. It makes people work harder when they see something they really admire and they have a goal to reach or surpass. But we don't, ultimately, it's a, an inner journey, isn't it? It's like, you know, creative expression or, or prowess in, in uh, you know, sport or, or athletics or whatever. It's, it's about beating yourself, ultimately. It's about, because it's a, it, everything is consciousness. Everything is internal. There's nothing, there's no external, there's only the interpretation of what's happening externally. It doesn't exist independently of how I experience it. So, you know, everything is inside. And so, you know, somehow we have to, na I don't know, somehow we have to navigate that and not get too caught, caught up in trying to be better than someone else. We, right. you know, if I get, if I run an 11 second, 100 meters uh, sprint, you know, then maybe I want to try and run 10.6 but not because the other guy did it but because i want to do i want to be myself yeah. you know right um, so, so yeah it's complicated isn't it i think it is all this stuff is complicated and and um and you know acceptance we live in a world that's so judgmental you know uh, and it's insane because it's so unnecessary really you know there's a, there's there's space for everything there's space for everybody i think there doesn't have to be you know concepts of right and wrong of tend to be quite subjective and then but then there's group think and everyone well you know if you like trump i'm never speaking to you ever again you know, <laughs> yeah. or whatever you know it's like it's ridiculously childish you know we've got more important things to think about like our communities and love and uh you know caring for each other and and you know deeper principles than if you like you know it's all this identity politics and yeah. It's, we're out of control, you know, uh, and yep. wars, unnecessary wars for, for for financial gain, but then they're posed as something different so that the, the masses accept it, you know, it's a far off land or whatever. I mean, without getting into it all, I just think from a human perspective, we, we, we were at this tipping point, where are we going to head, you know, what kind of world do we want to share? Um, but having said that, competition is good and <laughs> money is good. And, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm, I think, you know, some kind of capitalist concept with a little bit of social principles somehow combined makes sense as well. I'm not against capitalism at all. I think it's all really healthy, you know, uh, free market economy. I, I'm getting really deep on this stuff right now, but. Um, well, we love, we love it. John, John, the financial <laughs> analyst on Fox Business. Oh. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, right. and you know, mo and most of America is with you. Most of America is in the middle. You know, most of America. Well, and the me and the media has just been over. It's been kind of usurped or kind of controlled. Well, you know, you if you're working with Fox, you know. I mean, it's just out of control. But now we're having the alternative media that's becoming more powerful than the mainstream media. So that's. But I want to make it clear. I'm a, I'm an independent. I'm not. I'm oh not, no, it's uh, good. Uh, I mean, uh, me too. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I, I I'm see, very I'm very much a libertarian. I believe in I, I, socially. I, I, I think you should do whatever you want, and and fiscally, I think we should have this budget. But uh, that yeah, that's no, else. and I'm with you. I'm with you in the libertarian aspect. I think there's far too many control mechanisms on both sides of the equation. You know, we've got to get rid of all of that. We, you know, the idea that we cannot in, have our own intuition guide us. You know, all right, there's trauma responses, and there's screwed up things that can affect people's behavior but but the majority of people have a balance they have a guidance system whether we want to call that divine or or frame it as a religious experience or whatever you know that's again in a libertarian context that's up to the individual to what am i experiencing you know um what what does my gut feeling tell me i don't need a government to tell me how to act really I, that 
get away. I know. Yeah. I'm not out to her. I'm not. My guidance will define, you know, how I behave towards others. And it's not going to be, I'm never going to cross a line to hurt other people because that's not in my nature. Now, of course, there are some people that are like, they want to hurt other people, but it's a tiny amount of people compared to the majority. And I know that from traveling across America and have many, many wonderful friends in America. Then, you know, the, the people in America are the, some of the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. And people in Russia are the most, I mean, I've been to Russia once. Um, right. and they're just beautiful people. The people, right. they don't even know what's going on with Putin. You know, they don't, they, it's right. like, well, we don't really know. And I think it's the same in the States. It's like, you're just I've... bombarded with all this kind of, um, you know, rhetoric. That's, yeah. It's completely mind boggling, you know, but actually people just want to live their lives and yeah, their most lives. most of america is like me and uh, jerry we, yeah. we don't trump or biden we don't want either one of them yeah, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know you're gonna i guess you're gonna have probably have one of them probably <laughs> yeah. you, you never well, know yeah. you, you never know very very very, very uh, what good way to put probably have one of them. probably <laughs> yeah but, but if we don't if the world is not apology, we're, we're we're a country with only two choices and i i you know and when it, john and i did the one thing that's right we should have you, <laughs> no. know, you got well, 13, it, you know, 14 choices i mean we, yeah. but we don't have enough good people here i guess to, well to it's do. also that your your system it's slightly different from the UK, but your system is based on money. So if you don't have six hundred and fifty million, one hundred percent, six hundred fifty yeah. million dollars right. to promote yourself as the president, you're not yeah. going to have a chance. You might be the perfect president, you know. Yeah. But you're never going to get that chance because uh, you've yeah. got the, that thing in here, and you've got the lobby in Washington, all of that kind of stuff. But here we have, we also have an elite political class. That Rishi Sunak, for instance, is the current leader. You know, he's he's you know in partnership with the globalist world economic forum and klaus schwab and his his father has a company called infosys that's in partnership it's all huge the guy's a multi multi-millionaire his wife is a billionaire you know and they're running the country they don't even understand what you know that he got caught out you know he went he was doing this interview before he became i think it was before he became prime minister and he was at a gas station filling up a car but he didn't know how to use his car like he's so wealthy he had to he apparently he borrowed the car from somebody and pretended it was car like a little car to pretend that it's not that it was his you know it's just all fake and it's like who are you who are these people it's like they say about economists they're like supermodels they don't drive themselves yeah. and they don't eat so food and gas, <laughs> food and gas inflation they have no idea what that is you know, they don't, they don't oh, david food. david cameron a, a few years ago when he was prime minister he was on i think it was breakfast good morning tv or whatever and they asked him so how much is a loaf of bread and he went mm, 10 pounds <laughs> and it's like <laughs> so like 10 pounds you know which is like 15 bucks at the time yeah sure i mean if you want to buy the nice artisan yeah. like uh, organic <laughs> right. thing from your local bakery in uh, in the, uh, the cotswolds where you live but you know for the normal working person a loaf of bread is like one pound 50 or something you know yeah. but he right. didn't know he didn't know Right, he's so out of touch, and these people yeah. are the people making. And again, it's it's just it's slightly different in the U.S., but in a way, you we have these we have these political elites that are self serving towards the corporations. They're not serving. They're supposed to be you guys say by and for the people, right? But that's it doesn't really no. on a local on a local level. Of course, that does exist more. I'm sure on the more the on the Congress level, I would imagine it's more. People are more in touch with their communities and trying to do the right thing. I would hope, anyway. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't really. I'm not. It, it, it depends on what local level you're at. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, know. You, know, you know, Malcolm. But one of the greatest things about our both of our industry, we're in the entertainment industry. We're professional wrestlers. We we've been able. To, we've been blessed. We've got to travel. When you you being a rock and roller, you're blessed. You get to travel, and we get to see these different cultures we get to see these different environments and we learn from the people because but let's face it your fans and our fans are basically the same people and and you know we 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 kind of migrate towards our people and we learn so much from when you get to travel abroad i think that's my greatest education i've ever had and and uh is being able to travel 
to yes. different countries and and learn from them, and uh, that's what that's what what's so great about our 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 most of our industries. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's a beautiful thing, but it comes at a, a, a little sacrifice because we tend to be outsiders. You know, I, yeah. I mean, you know, holding down a relationship or or kind of um, having a certain you kind of have more of an itinerant life, I think. And you just have to accept that, you know, that it's there's a little bit of loneliness in that thing. You're kind of skirting around through things. But then the insight, as you say, the insight comes because you're able to see. And, you know, one of the biggest lessons I've learned uh, is that all humans are essentially the same, you know, yeah. black, white, you know, different. I, I, I see the human race as there's just one race. It's just a right. human race. You know, yeah. we, we divide, we call talk about racism, but in that sense, racism is a misunderstanding it's not it doesn't really exist when we realize that we're just people you know and and you know martin luther king had said he said that he wants to live in a world where his kids are not uh, judged by the color of their skin but by the quality of their character and i think that that's something that we can learn by traveling and, and meeting different people in different cultures there's cultural differences but racial differences i don't think they exist really you know cultural differences absolutely you know, for sure right well and then one of the differences because i've done a lot you know and in, in down in malawi and um rwanda and different places down there and also in poverty areas in the states and different uh different areas around the world is including india and the slums of mumbai and delhi every wow. kid's born with the same potential every kid's not born with the same opportunity and yes. that's the, that's the cultural difference you know to me that's you know that's not fair but it, as far oh, as yeah being born with the same potential, there's no difference in kids. I don't care what no. their skin color is, what their economic levels are. There's no difference. This no, and we're seeing, and different. I think we're seeing that with the the internet. Um, you know, it's kind of scary. You go on Instagram, for instance, and you know, like I some sometimes I hang out and talk with my drummer friends, and you know, you've got literally you know 650 million drummers that are all better than <laughs> right. you know uh, anybody has ever been. Um, you know, I'm exaggerating, but what I mean is that the potential is there. And I think that's why maybe the, um, certainly with the music industry, it's kind of, you know, the industry side of it, the record companies, it's, we're kind of in flux. We don't, you know, they, they don't know what to do, you know, so it's, it's an interesting time, I think, in that sense, because the internet does allow everybody a fair shot. Then on top of that, if you're not Taylor Swift with the six hundred million dollar budget <laughs> behind you, if you don't, the trick is right. You either do so. I'm going to be slightly rude. You either do a sex tape, or you you <laughs> have you go out with somebody. You know, like Taylor seems to go. Okay, I'll go out with Ed Sheeran. Then I'll get rid of him. Then I'll go out with somebody else famous. Then I'll go out with the N yeah. It's good timing. I'll date the guy from the NFL when it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> 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 like yeah, no, because I, I love him. You know, I really love him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and then like photo op. You know, yeah. um, so I mean that's that's that level of the business. And then it's uh, but she, bless her, it's not. It's average. It's not greatness. It's not cream it's not the beatles it's not the rolling stones it's not igor stravinsky uh or fella Kuti or whoever you want to talk about it's wow you got everything it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah it's like it's like mid-band frequency consciousness music that fills the space all the space but then if you look behind that space as you say there's just incredible potential everywhere all cultures just expressing themselves and doing amazing things but they're not, but you have to search it out, you know, because the mainstream is just filled with, I'm just going to sound like, I don't know whether you guys have saw the movie Amadeus, but um, about, uh, about Mozart, but you know, it's just great because the, it's Salieri was his rival and he just was ended up in a kind of loony bin and was going mediocrity everywhere, you know, and, and it's kind of feels, it does feel like that. And I'm not putting it does. down. She's yeah, amazing. It does. She's a great bitch. Taylor is an amazing business person and, and the songs are great and all of that, but real, you know, real art is kind of bubbling under the surface. And maybe it's always been like that. I don't know, but, um, but I hope and pray that, that real things somehow become more prevalent because, you know, maybe in my own small way, doing this thing, this cream thing, uh, helps to 
people to remember that this that there, there can be real art you know real that that moves people that changes people's lives that that has such an impact that it makes them grow spiritually you know um i think that's the, that's the capability of creativity and and also that thing as you said discovering you know this is a whole other massive topic but you know we have a, what is the media and consumerism as, as opposed to which is a very very new phenomenon you know um we used to be we used to you know make a you know i'm gonna make a rug at home i'm gonna play the piano for my with my family and sing songs around the piano and like be creative within ourselves you know now we're just put we're just looking at our phone going oh wow isn't that Taylor Swift amazing, you know, <laughs> or whoever, you know, we're looking outside of ourselves. And I think, um, you know, I think we, it would be really, really good if we all got more in touch with ourselves, you know, because then it puts everything else into con a bit more into context yeah. and less of other people telling us what to think and do. So, Malcolm, what what all has been involved with the the debut of the the tribute album? Have you been on tour? Are you going to tour? What what's involved now with the the, the launch of this album? Um, well, we've done. Um, I, I was talking to our friend John Lappin, who is uh, the publicist I've been working with. We've done, I think, close to five months now. Uh, oh, about one hundred and ten interviews, I think. So. Um, and I think we're winding down at this point. The label seemed to be pleased with the progress. But I think, unfortunately, because a few of the key people on the record have passed away, it's right. going to be quite hard to tour it. Um, but as I say, I'm going to be out with Kofi Baker uh, playing Cream. Um, so we might be selling this record on the tours. Um, but certainly it just all helps to keep the, keep the you know, the brand going. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> so, Mark... Malcolm, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. I, I could talk to you all day. I got a million questions to ask, but I, I, know, you, I know your time's limited, but I want to tell you, thank you so much for joining yeah. us. It's been a real pleasure, not only talking oh, to you, you. It's, been, it's been enlightening to talk to you, but it's also been such a pleasure watching your interviews leading up to this and l researching more and more about Cream, even though we knew a lot about it, about how great this band was and, and how great your father was and what a great thing you're doing. So thank you so much for taking thank your time you. to join us. Oh, well, my pleasure. And thank you for, for asking me. And, um, you know, maybe we can do it again sometime. Would love it. So. Oh, yeah, you're, you're over in Florida. That's where I'm I'm out living now. So I hope, hopefully your, your tour breaks you oh, down. Oh, whereabouts, whereabouts in Florida? I'm, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Oh, I have a, a, a friend who is a girl in Tampa. So, yes, <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, please do. I'd love, love to get with you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you, guys. Time.